Thank you. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Daryl. All right, so UiPath. I think I read <laughs> that your company is now worth seven billion dollars. Seven, well, supposedly. Yeah. Supposedly, depending on how you evaluate things. But you just you raised that round earlier this year. It was five hundred and eighty-six million. Is that right? Yeah, more than uh, half a billion. But more than half a billion. More than half yeah. a million. Um, so I think a lot of people here would appreciate if you just told them how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I started early, like in 2005, and then uh, after 10 years of struggle, we were able to raise a tiny seed round mm -hmm. we, from our friends here in Germany, early bar, which is a good fun. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot during my, uh, <laughs> during my early you know, days of raising capital. Mm. Our first raise took us 14 months wow. to complete. And, and that one probably wasn't uh, half a billion dollars. No, <laughs> it was like 1.6 <laughs> million. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, our last round took only less than two months to complete, from the first discussions to money in the bank. Wow, OK. So what, tell, tell me a little bit about that struggle you mentioned. You said there are 10 years of struggle? Yeah. Like, how was it in the beginning? Because it's really been recent that the inflection point has come on for your growth in terms of your customer numbers and revenue, so how do you, what's the early years look like and, and how do you keep going, I guess, during that time? Well, before starting UiPath, uh, I used to work for Microsoft in Seattle, mm -hmm. but uh, I wasn't feeling so comfortable there in the West Coast, and I had a crazy idea to start a company, right. and go back, and I thought that going back to Bucharest, Romania, would be the best which is a stupid idea. Well, yeah. well, so what, what about it, though, appealed to you specifically? Why? Well, I knew the culture, and I was able to hire some engineers without paying crazy you know, salaries. But it was really before knowing anything. It was before even TechCrunch. TechCrunch yeah. started, like 2006, started to watch it from Romania, not from the US. But I, I made all the stupid mistakes possible in building a startup, like, uh, failing too slow, you know, keeping on a product too much. Right. It's, it's been really a disaster. But somehow we build a, a technology on the umbrella of computer vision. And that we kept going and going with that stuff. And uh, we were really lucky to find a very big market. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this market, let's talk a bit about that too. Like the, the product uh, is robotic process automation. Yeah. RPA is the, the fancy term. Um, but I guess, can you just give us a summary of that for people that might not be as familiar with the, what that is? Well, <clears throat> I start a bit of how, how we do work today. What defines our work? It's, uh, it's been shaped uh, a lot during the 70s and the 80s. Mm. You know, personal computer, and then the graphical user interface, and then email, productivity tool, line of business application. So nowadays, all of all we do is to you know, read email, take some data from an email, work in a document, send it to some, someone else, ask for an approval. But we use these systems by the graphical user interface, mm -hmm. right? Business people make these processes. If you have a manager and they ask you, send me every week a report about uh, you know, the stock exchange in Berlin. Right. OK, this is work. Yeah. How do you do the work? You do your research, you use, but you use the interface. Mm -hmm. If you want to automate this work, let's say, you will have to translate the work you do visually into some APIs. But that's not an easy translation, and it's not a one-to-one -one translation, and it requires a lot of development time, product managers to make to, to understand between the two worlds, the business analyst and the developers. But our technology simply follow people's steps. We work with the, we touch the system via the user interface. Okay. So I can train, I can train our technology to really replicate the steps that you do. So you don't change the infrastructure, you don't have to translate into a computer language, you use human readable interfaces. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of self-driving cars. It's, and it's 
basically use the same technology, which is called computer vision. Yeah. So is that then, I mean, you brought up self-driving cars. That's, I think that's a good kind of analogy. Uh, for, is there a danger then that it's just a bridge technology and that eventually you get to a point where perhaps if we have more advanced <laughs> AI, like that there's, you skip this step where you require this kind of translation of the, the human input into ro machine input? Well, we use, first of all, we use a lot of AI into implementing our own technology. Right. Computer vision is based on there are a lot of deep learning models that we do behind the scene. But uh, I can tell you right now, the, it's not only for legacy systems. Mm. We use it internally, and we save to the tune of 100,000 hours per year, mm. which is the equivalent of maybe 60, 70 people work. Right. Our customers include Uber, Google, Facebook. So it's, uh, it's a technology that applies everywhere because it really taps into the nature of work. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, actually, it's interesting you mentioned that you use it internally. So you dog food everything, obviously. Yeah. And how does, that, uh, how does that work? Like, is it, is it something where you find that your culture readily kind of adopts to that? Or do you find, because I, I feel like with something like this, uh, not that I'd like doing these things, but that I am used to them and that it might be difficult to adjust because people are naturally static in their behavior, right? So, so how does that work for yourself? Yeah, that, 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 that's absolutely true, and this is what we've seen internally. Yeah. You, especially if you are in a company that grows a lot, mm -hmm. you start some, with some, a small group of people, they build some manual processes, they don't feel any, any need to automate them, right. the frequency of those processes is small. Yeah. So it's and everybody just knows. And so everybody fine. just knows, and you suddenly have to grow, and then people that had multiple heads, you know, separate one head only to this process, and they hire a bunch of people, and we find ourselves with 300 people in our corporate group, right. which is a lot, yeah. only in finance to do a lot of, I don't know, processing, invoice processing and all this stuff. Oh yeah, you get whole departments yeah. that are just process managers or like sub-departments that are yeah. process managers. Right? And we didn't, and really, we didn't really think of consuming our software because we had to scale so fast because it's faster to add people to the problem. Right. And that was wrong, inherently wrong. We, and now we, we started for, you know, like past 18 months to really push brutally our technology within our company. And I told everybody, this is not to replace people, this is to make your job better. But so on that point, like you did, you did have layoffs, and it sounds like the layoffs are coincident with when you've realized some of these yeah. efficiencies, right? Is, th is that directly correlated? Like aren't people actually losing their jobs? Or w let's get into why those well, layoffs I happen. Say, uh, I, would, I would go later in, a, in the nature of automation, and its relation to job losses. But I can tell you about us. We, uh, we scale from 2015, from 10 employees, into today to 3,000 employees. We hired 2,000 people in the past 18 months. Right. Beginning of this year, we were 2,000 people. We will end the year with 3,000 people. It's kind of natural when you scale as fast to have a lot of issue, first of all, in the organizational design. A lot of overlap jobs right. that, uh, you know, different people, you end up creating silos, and at some point you have to be able to change the organization. And uh, we had a lot of, we, I being, you know, being able to do an IPO was really a big initiative. but. I discovered that actually some of our own people use the IPO as a reason to slow down our processes. So we stopped becoming really a customer first company. So now that was the one of the primary reasons of this rework, get rid of you know bureaucracy, streamline processes, becoming much more agile. And I'm really happy with what's going on in this front. And second, you need to, despite the fact that we, we, uh, we have hundreds of millions in the bank, mm. 
we have to be in control of our destiny. So we want to be, we want to be profitable, you know, in the short horizon of time. Right. In 2020, our aim is to break even. So, so one of the aims you mentioned there was uh, was toward in service. You felt like it was a response to the the plan to go IPO because you had planned what a year to two years as of the beginning of. It was one of the reasons. Yeah. We have introduced bureaucracy and you know, a lot of redundant jobs. Yeah. Uh, so w is that at all related to your CFO's departure? Because you hired the CEO, CFO, uh, Marie Myers, I believe, at the beginning of the year, and then, you know, she's, she's now finishing out her term. It, it, was that well, an incompatibility that you're talking about related to culture, or is that? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's, an, uh, it's related to IPO readiness or specific things. Okay. But what I can tell, in a, in a hyper growth company, mm -hmm. it's, it's normal to, for executive to depart. 50% executive churn, mm -hmm. it's normal in a company. Mm -hmm. I really like Marie, and we had a very friendly uh, and positive departure, and we, but that was not, she was not the right choice for UiPath. That was all. She's a fantastic, great individual. But it happens. Yep. It's many companies, it happens. Yeah. So what about the IPO plans? Are those still, because you mentioned taking control of your own destiny, is that still the ultimate goal? Or do you anticipate going back to the market for, for more funding privately prior to that, or what? Well, we, we might. It, uh, it really depends on the market conditions around IPO. We plan for an IPO somewhere in 2021. We'll, uh, we'll really see about it. Market is still very strong. The private capital market can offer really high valuation. That is, right now, it's, they are very close with public valuation. So IPO, it's just another fundraising event, and uh, it's a good milestone for, for us and for, right. for all our employees. So on the fundraising, too, I, I heard a story, or read a story, that you refused a billion dollar and funding from uh, SoftBank, from SoftBank's venture arm. Is, yeah. is, is that true? Can you? Well, I, I met Massa, and it was funny. He's, very, he's an intense man. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, went to, I went to him, and uh, I was a bit right. And I said, we don't burn. We really don't burn too much money. We are a very efficient business. And he said to me, this is stupid. You should burn a lot of money. <laughs> Take a billion now from me, burn, burn it, and come next year, and I'll, get, I'll give you another billion. That <laughs> doesn't sound so wise in retrospect. Well, at that point, that was August 2018. So yeah. at that point, still, it, was, uh, it looked wise. But yeah, everything was rosy yeah, then, right? <laughs> Uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, kind of future plans product-wise. Yeah. So we talked about the future financial of the company, but like, what, what, are you, what are you looking at next? What are you going to tackle next? We talked about the acquisitions. Are you going to make more acquisitions? Or how's that? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really happy with the acquisition that we made because it allowed us to extend from pure RPA. We are an end-to-end uh, -end automation platform. So we, plan, we, uh, we have tools that help our customers into the process discovery phase, mm -hmm. which is kind of a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we have acquired a process mining company that we are integrating completely into RPA, a Dutch company. We build our own st stuff because we use our own, oh, thank you. Yeah. We use our own computer vision mm. to discover what people actually do right. on there and do some good recommendations for automations. We, uh, we also have uh, launched a tool for business analysts. Hmm. Well, automation require, at least our existing tool, require a bit of uh, programming expertise. Some, some kind of expertise some or knowledge. Kind, yeah. Not huge, but some. And now we've built a tool for business analysts that requires just to be proficient in a tool like Microsoft Excel. Oh, okay. They will be able to automate simpler activities. Yeah. And we've seen really fantastic adoption of this, uh, of this new platform. And is that deployed, that's already shipping? The, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. It's in, uh, it's in public preview. 
And do you plan to kind of expand how sophisticated the tasks are that that can handle? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right now we, we plan, and it's, the, it's bringing a lot of cognitive uh, technologies to be able to extend. Because naturally, our technology being uh, emulating people, mm. we have to progress more into cognitive things. Right, right. Because you have to, you, you, if you look at all the invoices in the world, once, you, once you've seen a few invoices, yeah. I can show you whatever invoice in English, and you'll be able to tell me Get what the are view. the light, everything. Yeah. You don't have to, I don't have to train you to give you templates and anything. This is how we learn. So we build machine learning models to become smarter and smarter, to work like people. Great. I, we, I, this kind of ties back into what, one thing we stepped away from, but what about you know, criticism that it is a, a job replacement thing, or that because you're doing this instead of having... Yeah, so coming back to this. Yeah. Uh, automation very rarely was able to replace jobs. Mm -hmm. Because people, do, people rarely do simpler tasks. Right. They, their job is compounded by a series of tasks, right? We call them activities. Yep. We are able to automate some of these activities, but it's very rare that you can automate a job in itself. And I've seen a McKinsey prediction that only 5% of jobs in the world now can be fully automated by the state-of-the-art technology. But technology can change jobs. This is very important. And can change jobs for better. And I'll give you a totally unrelated example from farming. And we've seen a yeah. startup here in the... Look, think how farming looked 100 years ago. And it was a really tough job. Very nobody, manual. Very manual. Farming is fun now. You look only at screens <laughs> and you have, you know, GPS. And like a video well, game. Yeah. It's like a video game. It's fun. I, I like to be a farmer. No, it's fun to be a farmer. <laughs> we, we, we will make jobs to be fun again. Oh, great. Okay. So you're talking about, like, essentially changing the quality, right? The quality of how time is spent. Yeah, we are, we are saying we take the robot out of human. Hmm. Because nobody wants to do the activities that we can automate. Right. And how do you help the, uh, we, we touched on this a little bit too, but how do you help the uh, transition of the worker, right, who is, who is used to doing this thing and who also still has to do that task to some extent to contribute to the learning of how to automate it, right? But how do you then um, reorient them so that they know how to take advantage of the new time they have or, you know, retraining, I suppose? Well, first of all, many this, uh, th there, there will always be exceptions that only humans can deal with. So some of, some of them, instead of spending time doing the repetitive part, right. will deal only with the exceptions. Maybe most of the invoice may be paid automatically, but some of them require calling the, the customer. Mm -hmm. It's much better to spend your time calling the customer, offering a good experience. Yeah, yeah. And this is, our, this is our experience. People are moving from more of a really process-oriented jobs into more customer-focused jobs. Okay, yes, yeah. so it's, better for, it's better for their customers, better for employees, better for everybody. Okay, great. So what, uh, what do you see in like 10 years' time? What does the workforce look like in terms of automation? How much is it penetrated, I guess? Well, to me, 10 years is really a big uh, time horizon. I, um, I never thought more than six to two years stop. Okay, in, let's in give it two years out. Two years. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that in, uh, in two years, uh, the big top 10,000 uh, companies in the world will, will, will seriously adopt oh, yeah. automation as a priority. And the shift uh, in this wave cannot be stopped. Mm. And people will, uh, people will understand that robots are their friends. It's a lot of Terminator kind of culture in yeah. the Western world that robots are your enemies. Actually, robots are your friends. You have a robot in your kitchen. You have a robot that is, you know, cleaning the floors. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, that's pretty rosy. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so thanks. I think we're just about out of time, but uh, appreciate the conversation. That's great. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>